my brother's keeper equity intelligence platform builds off of the work of President Obama's administration and subsequently the, by the Obama Foundation. The My Brother's Keeper equity intelligence platform seeks to improve societal outcomes, particularly for those that impact young men of color. Led by Bloomberg Associates with technological support by Bright Hive, the My Brother's Keeper equity intelligence platform started initially in Houston, Texas and Oakland, California. The pilot sites will pay, play a critical role in the development of the data platform. I'm pleased to invite to the stage our moderator, uh, David Goodman, who is the Vice President of Ecosystem Development at BrightHive. David is a cross-sector data measurement and evaluation expert with extensive experience building capacity to understand and use data. Also, he's going to be joined on the panel by Neobali Amra, who is uh, the My Brother's Keeper uh, lead at Bloomberg Associates. Noel Pinnock, who is the Executive Project Coordinator with My Brother's Keeper in Houston. And Cyrus Garrett, who's the manager of My Brother's Keeper Alliance at the Obama Foundation. Please welcome to the stage our wonderful panel. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this is an exciting project. Uh, I have the honor of being a part of. Uh, my name is David Goodman. I'm the Vice President of Ecosystem Development for BrightHive. Uh, for those of you who do not yet know who BrightHive is, we're a data collaborative company. We help organizations and communities uh, responsibly and securely link their data to enhance their impact, empower individual decision making, and increase equality of opportunity. Uh, I had the honor of joining this uh, uh, panel today talking about advancing the equity through shared administrative data. And we're going to do so through the lens of a project, um, as was just mentioned, uh, that we're doing in Houston, Texas right now, and uh, that is focusing on societal outcomes for boys and young men of color through the My Brother's Keeper project. And like most of you, the success of this project hinges on not only the availability of data, but the access to it, the collection of it, and the integration across sometimes disparate organizations that have different priorities or preferences for data. They have different definitions and measurements, uh, different formats, um, and also um, getting access to it, as most of you know who are doing work in this area, is very difficult and challenging. Not only accessing it, validating it, integrating it with other data, and then using it to uh, look at insights across uh, some of these organizations and across the city. Today we're joined uh, by uh, these three gentlemen, um, Cyrus Garrett with the Obama Foundation, Neil Bliarma with Bloomberg Associates, and uh, Noel Pinnock, who's the Bureau Chief at the City of Houston. Um, so I'd like to welcome them. And let's start, I want to start with you, Cyrus, because I, I think it's important to kind of level set and talk about my Brother's Keeper as a program, its evolution, and how we got to the equity intelligence platform. Thank you. Well, My Brother's Keeper started in 2014 in response to the, the tragedy of Trayvon Martin's death. Um, and at that time, I remember being at the uh, Department of Homeland Security, and we were all working on a bunch of national security border issues. And that happened, and the whole administration just stopped. Because at that point, we all recognized that everything, uh, the hope and change that we had brought to the White House has still been uh, left behind for so many young boys and men of color in their communities. Uh, President Obama called uh, to action local municipalities around the country, tribal communities, territories, uh, to step up for young men of color um, to identify the disparities in their communities and recognize that their future was our future. Um, the next level of taxpayer, the next generation of uh, civic uh, uh, citizen uh, is right there in those communities. And if we don't invest in them, uh, then we're going to all suffer as a nation. And for uh, fortunately, 250 uh, municipalities, tribal communities, and territories answered that call. Um, it's been running for almost five years now in February, um, and we've seen amazing work happen all over the country. I've been fortunate uh, to run one of those programs myself here in New York City under Mayor Bill de Blasio, a program that was started 
under former Mayor Michael Bloomberg. Uh, the Young Men's Initiative has done everything from recruit male teachers of color over 1,700 in two years uh, to reduce recidivism for cohorts of 14 to 27-year-olds uh, that have gone through the probation system up to 47%. So we showed that this work is real and it can happen. And the way that we did it here in New York was based on data. Data, measurement, proof, evidence, and retread, right? And so um, that we want to see that work blossom around the country. And we believe in order to make sure that work is continuously improved, we need an undergird, a foundation of a data system like the EIP um, so that we can share those lessons across the country. Yeah, and this is, I mean, this is, we're not saying anything new to the people in this room. The ability to... Uh, collect this data, look at it across organizations, across different populations, how critical that is. And I, I want to bring Neobly into this because Bloomberg steps in here and um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the approach that Bloomberg Associates is taking with EIP um, and maybe some of your background with My Brother's Keeper as well. So I, I guess I should start off and also give more context. And so when the Obama, found, uh, when the Obama White House, before it was the Obama Foundation, launched MBK, um, they issued a community challenge. And so mayors across the country raised their hands and said, we're going to do something about this issue. And so me and Linda spent two years traveling across the country, working with cities. There were collective impact tables. And, and we were surprised and also a little sad that in the, in the middle of a major initiative about moving the needle for young men and boys of color, there was a lack of a discussion laser focused on outcomes and impact. Mm -hmm. So many people were busy planning. You, you, you would sit in a city and you would meet people who said, I've done this work for 30 years. And we say, well, well tell us what you've accomplished. Right. And every city, after, every city after every city, there's not one mayor's office that we walked into. And, and you know, the Bloomberg folks, we were going to ask questions about data-informed decision making and show us your numbers disaggregated by race, age, and gender. And, and it was sad that in this day and age, with so much capacity for change, grassroots folks, people in local government, they don't have access to any of the tools that the people in this room took for granted. Right. Uh, and so we started to ask ourselves, what could be our unique contribution to the field, uh, particularly around outcomes? And, and what we found out is that the cities are rich in administrative data, but in, in the case of, of even New York, there's an annual report that's put out. You know, what happened when young, and, and so by the time the report comes out, it's too late to intervene. And so we started having a discussion uh, about building the equity intelligence platform to get data out of government agencies, um, longitudinal data, real time, populated to a dashboard, so that if a police chief wants to know in this area there was a crime last week, what was the truancy rate from the school district? Or how many people have uh, in this neighborhood got a visit from CPS? Just layering outcomes on top of each other so we can figure out what's happening with young people and young men in particular across systems. Uh, and so that's the work we've been doing and the work we've been piloting in Houston. Yeah, it's a really important point, too, because I think we all see some of the anecdotal evidence that happens in the cities, like uh, the success in this one area. But for, to, to really affect change community-wide and even scaling that more, we have to turn one successful story into a thousand similar stories so that we could replicate it, so that we could do this through data and we're learning. And, and Noel, I want you to talk a little bit about what was going on in Houston and why this connection to EIP was so important and critical for the work that you do with the city, but also the other uh, organizations that you work with in Houston. Right. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let, let me just say this. is When the city of Houston stepped up to the challenge, um, everything's bigger in Texas, <laughs> right? And we did not take the challenge shortfall. We took it in full. We said that in Houston, we want to make sure that we do everything that's possible to dismantle the cradle to prison pipeline. And the way to do that, obviously, is be deliberate, informed, and intentional about every action that we take. So in the city of Houston, when we talk about my brother's keeper, I mean, it's an easy way to say, but in reality, when you inform the practices that ensure that kids enter school ready to learn, read on grade level by third grade, graduate high school prepared for college and career, complete post-secondary education or training, enter the workforce successfully, and at the same time, we reduce crime and violence, provide second chance opportunities for those kids that will not follow that pathway of, of righteousness, if you will, then we're doing a great thing. Mayor Turner will tell you this, uh, that we can fit fix all the potholes in our city. But if we don't fix the potholes in the lives of the people who live in the city, 
then we've done nothing. So David, in context to the work and also Neobly in terms of how do we measure our impact, a lot of the work that we've done has not been seated on ribbon cutting efforts. Efforts that we know can tokenize our young people, efforts that oftentimes you see come but they leave, They've been seated on the, na on the reality that if we want to make a big difference in our city, then we have to be deliberate about it. And we have to measure our success. We make a decision early on. We don't want to go wide and go shallow, right? We want to go deep and make certain that there's an impact. And, and I've always lived under this, this guise all my life. In God we trust, the rest show data. And when you have data that informs, then you have data that can transform communities. And that's been our challenge from the very beginning. When we talk about the sectors, health, education, employment, and justice, all of these sectors have their own data set. And they pride themselves on being data rich. What we find in this work is that we're program rich, but we're systems poor. Because the data doesn't talk across the sector. And so the, what we've been doing over the course of this journey is getting people to peel back the onion a little bit, take the cuffs off the data, right, and help them work across the white space that exists within silos. That, my friend, has been one of the biggest challenges, but also will be the greatest opportunity that we will see not only in the city of Houston, but also in this country. Because now we get to play with each other and show what that data said. Now, let me give you the worst example of data was given to us. And Linda's in the room right now, and I'm going to say this, that if you torture data long enough, it will confess to anything. <laughs> Don't ever say that again, all right? <laughs> because that's not the truth. The truth is that data will inform the decisions that we make, and it will also inform the practices that we do, and ultimately will change the lives of the people that we're here to serve. Uh, you, most of the people laughing were the data scientists. <laughs> so, and, and, and by the way, I, I've got a couple potholes in my uh, suburban Houston home, so I'm going to contact you about <laughs> yes, that. Yes, please. But you bring up a good point, and this is one thing that I think you and I um, really realized as we started doing this project, is not only is, is this really critical about creating that infrastructure and the shared data, but some really interesting thing happens uh, to these organizations who are so geared on compliance and working with their own silos. If we get them around the table and start talking about their work and their needs and their challenges, something really happens around the culture of collaboration within a city that traditionally don't work together or they work together through a, a um, unilateral data sharing agreement. Precisely. Right? So can you uh, talk about a little uh, of that? Well, you know? let me just say this. You know. Many of you guys probably understand what collective impact is. You, you've probably seen the five-step definition. But, you know, it's really great on paper. But when you put it into practice, it comes with a lot of backstage noise. <laughs> and those are the things that you don't see when you come on stage. And, and one of the things that we've been doing very successfully in the city of Houston is galvanizing people around the notion that you cannot operate successfully by yourself, meaning that the school district which is the seventh largest in the state, in the, in the country's first largest in the city, in the, t in the state of Texas, you know, you can serve about maybe 30 to 40 percent of that child's needs academically. Now, I'm a former educator myself. I taught sixth grade, right? Lovely. But at the end of the day, I know that when those sixth graders marched in my classroom, that me academically and from a didactic perspective can have an impact in their lives. But if you pull back and look at the iceberg, then there's a lot of different things going on in that child's life, in that family's life, that begs a need far greater than what oftentimes we can extend in the classroom or in that school building. It requires the village, right? And everybody's seen that scenario, David, that it takes a village to raise a child, but there's two questions we never ask. One, who trains the village? And then two, who in the village is invited to the training? And so it, it becomes now an incumbent, right, and deliberate approach for us to say, this is what we're going to do. And these collaborations have to be deliberate and at the forefront of every decision. So we have over 250 partners, almost comparable to the territories and, and the jur jurisdictions that accepted the challenge. And one of the great things that we found is that everyone that's come to the table, the collective impact table, have all said yes. 
They just needed a level of guidance and support. And what I believe EIP will do for us in the city is provide the icing on the cake and allow us to know that even at the end of the day, if you remove the icing, you still get a little cake. Yeah, it, y'all get that. It, <laughs> and, and we're gonna we're gonna save some time for questions um, after we get through a little bit more of the panel because I know we've got 45 minutes for this, and, I, and some of you will have some questions before we talk about exactly what we're doing in Houston, uh, Neil. Billy, Cyrus, I was wondering as you're listening to this and you're traveling around the country talking to different cities, how common are these issues? Are you hearing anything different, or is this? Pretty similar across the state. Uh, this is very similar. This is the, the, the tired and true uh, way in which work has been done at the municipal level for so long. Um, oftentimes, you look right now and you say, okay, if I were to do, if just go in and do an audit of the local government spending and say, okay, what has been the return on investment of the programmatic spending you've been doing over the last six decades, right? You would oftentimes see a plateau that would hit around the second decade or so of that 60, uh, 60, 60 years, right? Um, but we haven't changed anything since then. We've said that's as good as we can do, and we're just going to leave it there because we don't want to fight Ms. Johnson for her mentorship program, right? And, and that's been the way that we've done business at the local level. It's very transactional, very much based on who the political power is at the center, not based on what the best, most efficient use of tax dollars is, not based on the equity needs of the community, not based on the long-term trajectory that we want to see our communities move on. And so that's what the data platform around EIP is, the conversation is about, is how do we actually shift the conversation away from this group versus that group and say, okay, what are the actual collective equitable holes uh, that we need to fill, the disparities in our safety net as a community that are the, uh, would allow for us to be able to build the stepping stones to the future that we know we need, right? So Chicago is going through a process right now and trying to become the blockchain city of the future, right? And that's the only way that they can do that, right, is if they actually have the workforce of the future. Only way they can do that is if they train the people that are going to be their workforce of the future, which is predominantly already, it's already brown, right? It's predominantly black and brown. And so if they don't get a hold of what's happening on the south and west side and figure out how to turn that into positive outcomes, then they're, they're gonna miss the boat for the future jobs uh, of uh, the jobs of the future. Um, and only way they're gonna be able to figure out what to actually do that's actually gonna be measurably impactful is to be able to call the data that comes through all the social service systems that they have coming through that city. I, I tell people the story about, um, I think it was like the fourth, fifth month I was on the job here, and I get an alert from the NYPD that they're gonna round up 100 youth uh, from the Dykeman projects. And I said, okay, how did you even find 100 youth to round up? I can't get them to go to the program right down the street. <laughs> How did you find them so quickly? And it's because they can take the metadata and they can link and they can make the association so fast on that side because they've broken down the silos. After 9-11, all of that came down. From Homeland, I mean, from the CIA, NSA, all the way down to your local NYPD officer on the street. They have that information. They know how to use it and they know how to mobilize it. We don't have any of that on the social service side. So we're way behind. By the time those 100 kids get identified, we've missed so many intervention prevention points up until that point. And so that's really what the promise of the EIP is. And I think that's really what communities are, are clamoring for around the country. I think the place we want to play a, a position in this is the Obama Foundation is being that convener, that thought partner, the one that helps us identify how we ethically use data moving forward so that we can enter in these conversations with community and not do it for them, but do it with them. Yeah, and, and no, we heard this in one of those first meetings with the uh, Houston Independent School District's truancy officer and right. what her use case was. And she said, by the time I hear about these kids being out of school, they're long gone, and she needs that real-time, yeah. actionable data to know uh, where they are, where they come from, which interventions they're already currently in to be able to do some actionable, actionable interventions. Um, Neobly, I think it would be even, uh, helpful if we talk a little bit about what we're doing in Houston around yeah. the EIP uh, platform or the EIP program. Um, you want to talk a little bit about uh, the specifics, and we can talk about some of the lessons we're learning and oh, yeah. some of the lessons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It sounds good to talk about it up right. here. It's painful to, to live it day to day. <laughs> um, and so our, our projected launch for our prototype, I would say, is Q1 of, of next year. Um, we are 16 months into the project. Um, what we have learned is that technology is the easiest thing. That's right. It can be done. Entity resolution is possible. No reflection of Bright Hive, of course, yeah. right? <laughs> with with Bright Hive, you guys are awesome. Um, but the technology can so. be done. And so we have three work streams going on in Houston. 
Um, one, and I'll break each of them down to you and give you the context of what's happening across each and how we're bringing it back together. Uh, and so the three work streams are executive buy-in. And so we have had to get in front of the mayor, the county judge, the chief of police, and, and verbally get them to say that, yes, I believe in this, um, and that there is political will. Um, and that, it, and just getting executive buy-in could take 12 to 16 months. Um, and, and not only does it, can it take 12 to 16 months, but you have to understand that the, the executives who understand these institutions are not connected to the technology offices that operate them. And so when the mayor sits in a meeting and says, I believe in, in this work around young men and boys of color, he's thinking about that outside of the context of what are the technology solutions and data systems currently in place. Right. Um, the second work stream um, are all the data scientists um, and, and technology folks who are in these agencies. And so what we found is that Houston actually has very sophisticated systems. Um, the, the district attorney's office is one of the only offices in the country that does 24 downloads about arrest records and reports. Their, their body cam pictures um, immediately come from the HPD, Houston uh, Police Department, over to the district attorney's office. So independently in uh, Houston, the systems are very sophisticated. Um, and then the last group, which we, we have learned the most about, are the lawyers, um, <laughs> the chief counsels. God bless them. Um, and, and, and I, I wish I could unpack this for like 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> because the, the answer when you walk into a room and say, I need all of your data, we're only going to show population level, but we have to touch everything, social, birthday, the answer is absolutely no. No. They don't care what the mayor has said. The, the, the IT person could be sitting next to them saying, hey, we could do this, and it's actually going to help us. Because IT people have asked us, well, what data can we get back? Uh, and, how, and, and, and to what degree can your technology sit on top of what we have in place? And you know, th these are AWS sophisticated organizations. And right. so the technology people are excited. And then the general counsel is sitting in the meeting saying, absolutely not. There's way too much risk. And in and, and our theory of change that, that we've thought about and what we want to talk more about, we hope it comes out of this project, is that the data does not belong to the city. Right. It belongs to the people. Right. That's right. Uh, and you have folks who have been in agencies for 10, 20, 30 years, and they, and they treat it as theirs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we've done uh, for, the, the, for the, the legal work stream group is that we've pulled out data sharing agreements, MOUs from across the country, uh, stewards for change. Um, and we're trying to figure out what is an ideal enterprise data sharing agreement that when we go to more cities, that upon entry, we could sit with these legal counsels and say, look at these clauses. It's the same language. Uh, and as long as your political executive is willing to take that risk, then there's nothing illegal about what we're trying to do. Uh, if anything, the for-profit realm has been doing this for years, yeah. and it's why it's been growing. But when we want to do it for social service and for social impact, everyone gets gun-shy and scared. Uh, and, and so th these, are the, these are the things that we're going against. And it's not, it's not easy. I mean, I, I would say in Houston right now, if we had to call the card today on how many MOUs we could sign, there would be one major, one major um, agency that still wouldn't come to the table. But that's the goal of the project. We have to be on the ground. We have to be super transparent. Um, we have to listen more than we talk. Right. Uh, because th guess what? This is not the first data dashboard or platform that they've been introduced to. Uh, and so, and what we've learned is that so many technology companies have came and overpromised and underdelivered. And so, what is unique about this? Just because it has the Bloomberg brand on it doesn't mean it's easily acceptable. And so, I would say because of our partnership uh, with the city of Houston, because we have Obama Foundation, um, the four of us plus Linda are on the ground in Houston regularly. Um, and I can tell you that our job is to keep the legal councils in the room. The moment that they say that they're not coming to the next meeting, it can kill the project. And as long as you keep them in the room and keep bit by bit by bit, of course we have a timeline. But mm -hmm. when you're doing this work in community, all that goes out the window. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I say Q1, but it can change. But at least people are in the room, and there's a commitment. Um, and, and I'll say the last thing just about the work we're doing there that I think is important for this audience to hear, that yes, this is for young men and boys of color, but like all equity impacts, everyone's going to benefit from exactly. this. That's right. Every single agency that sits in the room and, and has this conversation about how to share more data more fluidly, if the only thing you care about is Latino women between the ages of 18 and 24, the platform's going to serve that audience. It's, it's going to raise the tide for everyone. And I think it's important to say that when you're building capacity around these projects, it's not just for these young men and boys of color. It's for mm -hmm. our systems. It's to make us better uh, so that we have greater impact. Yeah, it's an important point, too, um, that you're making about, especially about the lawyers, because as everybody knows how this typically works, 
somebody sends someone a DSA, the lawyers redline it, they go back and forth, and they're like, no, 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 if you do this, we'll say yes. We're getting them around the table, so not only are they able to articulate their constraints or some of their practices um, that they're used to and, and can hide behind, they're hearing what other organizations and agencies can and can't do. And what we're realizing is the no ways are, well, maybe we can do this. Or if we're going to get that data, then maybe we can uh, create a proxy of this measure that we can't legally share, but will give us the information that we need to say the things that we need to say. And that's the critical part, is that we're around the same table. We're talking about, I mean, statutorily, uh, juvenile justice can't share data with the uh, Justice Department on the same server. No way they can't, there's no way around it. But what we did is we found a way, we asked the question, what do we need and what do we want to say? What do we want to examine? And we can go around and we can create proxy measures, or we can create uh, workarounds. But if, if we're not around the table talking about that, that never happens, and it's a, it's a non-starter. I will say the one thing that's really interesting that holds true, for any of you that have done work, uh, collaborative work before, organizations, whether you're in the public sector, private sector, or the philanthropic sector, they're like penguins. They all sit on the edge of the iceberg and they wait for one of them to jump in. If he doesn't get eaten, if he doesn't get eaten, he comes up for the air, then they all jump in. So right. I think we're experiencing a little of that uh, in Houston. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think too, David, to that point is, is that you always have to remind the constituents, right, that this is what we're here to do. And at the end of the day, that's been kind of the reminder every time we're on the call and again, speaking on the behalf of the, being deliberate about it, is that sometimes you know people don't make the decisions that they need to make because they miss the mission that they need to understand. And so, whether you are on juvenile probation, whether you are an educator, whether you are a social service provider, whether you are in the housing authority, we're all trying to do the same thing. Yeah. And, 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 and let, me, let me paint a picture for you. If you walk into your high, the typical high school in America. That's what people do with data. They section it off. There's really no collaboration. There's no meeting in the middle. There's no let me share. I'll give you my potatoes and you give me your macaroni. <laughs> it's, 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 it's isolated. And we cannot become prosperous in isolation. Isolation is the kill factor in our country. We need to bring the data together, show how they are connected, and inform the practices that we know will drive success. I mean, the one thing I wanted to say about it, that, you know, that, that's one of my favorite sayings that the president ever says is rising tide lift all boats. But I always say, not if it's got a hole in it. And data, it helps you understand where the holes in that boat are. And, and the fact that there's so many communities right now that um, just cannot make it above water. And right. the, the idea is for us to be able to be intentional about one, identifying what they're going through. The worst thing in the world, and the thing that makes you feel most crazy when other people don't validate what you're feeling, um, and with the data we can actually put a name and understanding to what they're feeling um, in their communities and actually help take them along on the journey toward the solutions that will best uh, fit each one of them. Let me say this real case scenario. We had a student that was excessively absent. We had a student that was excessively referred to the principal's office, right? And they were, the student was failing. Now, at the, at the outset, you would think that, man, this kid is just destined for failure. But when we identified the kid need, we actually went to the kid's home, found out that the kid didn't have running water. They had a porta potty in the backyard. This is Houston, fourth largest city in the country. And the reason why the kid was excessively absent, <clears throat> getting into trouble, and failing grades is because every time he went to school, the kids picked on him. So he had to stand up for himself. What we did is use that as a, as a measure to say, you know what, let's find out what's going on with mom. Mom, why isn't the bills paid? Let's get mom connected with some work, right? Let's get with the school because guess what? If you open the school early for him, he can take a shower. We have clothes he can put on his, on his back and he can go to school, guess what? The scenario was dramatically changed. That kid now is on the track for graduation. He's coming to school and his grades are up. Simply because, guess what? We had to dig a little deeper beyond just the superficial level. And God, we trust the rest show data.
And yeah, it's a great point too, because using that particular instance allows us to go back and look at the data and see, is this the same kind of issue that's happening mm -hmm. for other students and in other communities and things like that, which is, um, you know, one of the things that we're learning with uh, this project now is that when you sit down with these different agencies and you say, tell us about what, your wor what work do you have, what kind of reporting requirements do you have, and you ask them the question, what would you like to be able to do that you can't currently do? And right. that essentially opens up, you see their eyes light up as data scientists, you guys are like, yeah, that's pretty cool. So uh, this, this has been a real kind of revelation for us. Um, you want to talk, Neobly, a little bit about um, some of the other process um, in terms... I don't, I don't want to get into too much of the technology. I think, as Neobly said, the technology is the easy part. The one thing that is unique for this project um, from the Bright Hive standpoint is that we're a public benefit company, and so we are mission-driven. All of our technology is open source, which means that any of these agencies can use that data, build upon it, integrate it with their existing systems. We don't require them to change their systems. Um, and we do this in a way that uh, integrates uh, in a way, whether it's through APIs, uh, but we do it securely in a way that sometimes you need SSNs. If SSNs aren't there, we have ways of linking that data, which the data scientists here, we call it fuzzy matching, uh, right? You know what that is? Uh, but that's, and that's one of the biggest hurdles too, is explaining to some of these agencies, especially the lawyers, that, well, we can't give you SSNs or we can't give you identifiable data. As you guys all know in this room, we can do that. And um, uh, that's one of the ways that we're able to kind of link that data and make it uh, more actionable for the different organizations. Right, so th there's a, a few other pieces to the project. We, we're talking about Houston as a case study now. We started this work in Oakland and are still working in Oakland. Um, and you may w ask the question, well, what indicators are they talking about? Uh, and so we actually took three different frameworks about indicators um, the, 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 of, on the life course framework, which is a methodology that says if you get young people through these stages, then they'll stay on the right path. And so there was the Arnold Chandler framework. And we, we wanted to make sure one of the core values of this project that it's not just us saying these are the things you should measure, but that you're engaging community and service providers on a broad level. And so um, in, in March of 2016, we spent a few days on the ground in Oakland and did workshops about if you could measure impact or what are the things that are important to you. Uh, it, that, that's, that's an important note. If you ask that question, you will get a lot of answers. Uh, and so at the end of that process, we had 160 indicators, uh, <laughs> most of which people wanted to measure things that no one's even tracking. Uh, and so we went through a process um, with our, our national stakeholder group, which are, uh, has folks from NNIP Project, um, Executives Alliance for Young Men and Boys of Color. We have a national advisory council that we take these things back to. And so we started working using the national frameworks, cro crosswalking with what we heard on the ground, and we ended up with 25 priority indicators um, across the four domains that Noel talked about, justice, workforce, education, and health. Things like um, third grade reading scores, fourth grade reading scores, um, truancy levels, uh, dropout levels. And what I could say is that uh, what, what we have found in this project is that there is a dire need to have a national discussion about data definitions. Mm -hmm. um, you, high school graduation cohorts is measured at least 10 different ways. Um, and most of the standards that we use are from places like California, New York, and Texas because they're so big. And when you get in front of these data managers um, and agencies and they have such a unique way of capturing something, we have to go back and figure out what are the different ways that we can get to a broader definition. And so one of the things is that we're going to use national best practices and we're going to have to choose definitions and scale those. And, and maybe in a few years we'll have a discussion about uh, shifting that. But, but it is telling us that you, we can't talk about impact in Oakland and in Houston in the same vein because a lot of the indicators are tracked completely differently. Uh, and so there's a lot of work going into mapping the indicators, um, figuring out what are the national standards, what are the local standards, what are the most unique ways, and then finding all these other national initiatives and saying, hey guys, you got to come in the same tent with us and at least talk to us. Uh, because again, there's so many off-the-shelf tools that school districts are just buying to do some of this work, uh, and what we're producing it is highly customizable. Um, I'll, I'll say one more thing, and I think we should shift to questions, David. Yeah. But uh, there are a few things you should know about the EIP. We want the EIP to be free, uh, mm -hmm. and so right now it's funded by philanthropy, a, a number of different philanthropies, and the goal is that there will be fees associated with, with keeping it up annually, maintenance, but we want as many cities as possible to be able to plug into this um, and then I, it, it's all automated. 
It's all automatic. And so the conversation that we're having with technologists in cities is not about these new manual feeds, but how do we just attach tools together and, and use open source data to, to make it uh, work um, through the future. And so it's, it's very much we're learning in real time, but we have a few battle scars, but we're going to get, you know, it, and we're back on the ground in a few weeks to go back in there. And, and the goal is that if we keep at it, eventually we'll get to a good enough MVP and then we'll go live. Because of course we have these broad hopes and aspirations, but for us it's about good enough. Mm -hmm. Because if you let perfect, perfect be the enemy of good, we'll never get there. And, and I think our focus is to make sure that we do at least get to phase one. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll take some questions in a second. I, I wanna kind of finish Cyrus talking a little bit about the Obama Foundation's vision for EIP beyond Houston. Uh, I'm fine working with Noel every day, just so you know, which is going to be great. But I'm sure the, you have some thoughts about uh, where you want this to go. Yeah, so uh, my, my job at uh, the Obama Foundation is with My Brother's Keeper Alliance, and my specific job on that team is overseeing the communities um, and directly the grants that we'll be providing. So we just ran a competition. Uh, we got back over 200 applications for that competition. We'll be providing uh, 17 grants in 12 communities. Um, and those grants will come along with technical systems provided from the Obama Foundation, from experts from around the country, um, and we'll be doing that in partnership with a number of uh, partners such as Bloomberg Associates. Um, and a part of that work is going to be identifying uh, next uh, pilot cities. Um, so those grantees um, from everywhere, from tribal territory, uh, tribal communities to territories, uh, will all have an opportunity to really learn um, what is necessary to be a good EIP pilot. Um, and as well as get themselves onboarded. We're working right now with a consultant to create a toolkit um, that will allow for my team, once they hit the ground, to be able to easily identify who the players are in the community that need to be at the table for these conversations, for us to be able to flag for Bloomberg Associates when it is a good time for them to come in and start having these conversations. And hopefully within two years, Houston is up and running. It looks really good. And we're looking at two additional cities. Um, you know, my, my hope is Chicago is one of those cities of being Chicagoan. Uh, and, and hopefully another pilot community uh, to push this through. So we are looking for an expansion plan that, that sees us growing on two to three cities per year, hopefully. Um, and that pace, I think, would expand into the future once we kind of get the rhythm down of how this works. You know, in, in Houston, <laughs> Linda would tell you that I'm painfully optimistic. And I will. And let me just tell you this, guys. If, if you go into this work with the anticipation of the possibility of failing, then like Henry Ford said, <laughs> you will fail. You have to continue to remind yourself that this is going to work. The relationships that are at the table are critically important, and most people oftentimes take that for granted, that when I can pick up a phone and say to the, the DA or the judge or the police chief, hey, I need your assistance. I got on a call with Henry Gonzalez, which is the the new executive director for juvenile probation, I'm like, dude, I need to talk to you. We need to make sure that we're pushing this item forward. That is the, that, that can make or make, make or break a deal. <laughs> Relationships, and always keeping the vision in front of the people, letting them know at the end of the day, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. Let's open up to questions. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Yep. So, uh, you got a microphone here. Really interesting discussion. Um, my question is about a word that was mentioned a couple of times, but I think not enough times, and the word is transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, so could you speak a little bit to what you guys are doing proactively as part of this platform to be able to explain uh, to the people to whom the data belongs how their data is being used and to explain the decisions? Yeah. And in a way of context, I'm actually a member of the Automated Decision Systems Task Force in New York that looks at transparency of city uh, services. So I, I can jump in yeah. briefly. Um, so there's a few things. And so th this project is governed by a public charter. Uh, so there's a, a charter document that organizations have signed that said they will participate, talking about the values, et cetera. Um, within that process, what we have told everyone from the very beginning <coughs> is that our commitment to data means that eventually you're going to show something that you're not going to be proud about. Um, and we have to be willing to stand behind that on the front end. There's a number of privacy commissions. There's actually more in Oakland than there is in Texas uh, that have also reviewed this project uh, because th there is fear out there. You know, well, well, what happens if someone breaks in and you can start identifying people? And so 
that there, we're, we're having as many public conversations as possible to address transparency. Um, I know that indicators that once the cohort set gets too small that you can identify, we're not going to put in the platform. And so we're going to make sure that, um, that, that that is accounted for. Uh, but it goes back to the public will and executive buy-in. And, and um, the, school board, um, the school boards, the city councils, all of those entities are, know about the project. And so our job is to, is to make sure that it's not a, a backroom deal, that right. when people know we're in the city, it, it's on the, you can go into the city of Houston and see who we're meeting with and what we're meeting about, and our agendas are public, because we know that, that, that we have to have that commitment set from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And one thing I'll add that we didn't touch on too much is the idea that this collaboration in Houston and through EIP is governed by the stakeholders in that community. Yep. We've actually set up a data, uh, a governing body uh, an advisory council that essentially is made up of the stakeholders. So Bright Hive, Obama Foundation, Bloomberg Associates are not controlling this. These stakeholders make up uh, the decisions. What are our use cases? What data? What are the permissions? What is the responsible use? What's the ethical use for these? Who gets permission? Who gets to do what? They make up this body. They create essentially that uh, multi-party MOU that says all of these things. And then sustainably over time, right. if somebody comes in and says, hey, I want to add my data or I want to try a new use case, this governing body decides. So that's a really unique uh, structure and mechanism in place for the communities to continue to own this and govern it and make sure that it's uh, uh, appropriate and meaningful for the work that they do. And that's something that uh, is going to be a part of the EIP moving forward. Yes, sir. Yeah, data, data repository of data being misused also, and one of the concerns legal community probably may have is that what happens, number two, uh, number one, if data is had, number two, with the present privacy, federal as well as state level, privacy laws which are there, right, that they do not provide any protection to the attorneys, their ethic rules are, are also in right, place. So when there are so many concerns that ethic rules, privacy laws, uh, say for example, HIPAA regulations are there. So isn't that the legal community has a genuine concern? Well, let, 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 me, let, me, let, let me stab at that because Bright High, Bloomberg, and the Obama Foundation, I'm having my backroom conversation with these folk, right? And, you know, it's, it's at a point now where we're saying what we've been doing hasn't worked. So we got to do something different. And I think that that's at the forefront. Yes, I just recently got hacked. My bank, Wells Fargo, you know, somebody went into the bank and, <laughs> and, and, and transferred money at a teller into my account and then withdrew the money and then found out I had more money. They went to another bank and stole the rest of the money. So we know the propensity of, of these things happening. And that's just the reality. We can safeguard, secure as much as we possibly can. But the idea is, is that what are the outcomes that are driving our communities? What are those things that are making us have aches and pains? And what are we doing about it? So we understand that there is a propensity for that. And of course, you know, David can talk about all the data security measures, the encryption and animizations, you know, that, that, that can take place to secure data integrity. But at the end of the day, we have to move something because, you know, at the, what we're going to do. And, no. and, and what I will say is that the difference between this project and other projects, this is not for research purposes. Right. And so institutions give their data away every single day mm -hmm. to researchers. And, 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 and the same concerns about is it HIPAA compliant? Like there's a list of about 20. We have a document with 69 questions that the lawyers asked. And we were able to answer every single question. Yeah. This project is not unique. It's not more risky than any other thing. We're just trying to make data publicly available at the population level for young kids across systems. Yeah, and the only thing I'll add to that is that it, it's both a technology question, but it, it's also uh, an education question and a collaboration question. So we can impose as much constraints about the transfer uh, protection of data in transit and at rest and do whatever we can on the technical side, but we have to build the capacity of these organizations to understand through the MOU what they can do with the data, who has access to it. But it's an education uh, that we do as well. Yes, ma'am. Hi, yes. Um, I'm actually uh, doing some research um, and teaching at MIT um, about why people don't share data. Um, and one of the biggest reasons you guys mentioned is um, uh, 
these, um, I guess, legal documents that um, would help us to share the data. And I guess what I wanted to ask you is, obviously you guys did a lot of work um, to uh, bring the legal uh, people to the table to get an understanding. How could that work be shared more broadly? Um, do you think that it's transferable to other cities? Do you think that you could create kind of a standardized document that um, then could be transferred to Oakland or to other uh, cities that you're working with, but um, and maybe even Philadelphia, right? Because I think these problems, um, as you say, um, really you're trying to use data for good. And I understand that the protection is important. We want to protect people, we really do. Um, so how do we create standards that allow us to do that. So I'd love you to kind of talk about how transferable some of this work would be um, and how can we create better standards? I'll just say real quickly, I think the standard we want to impose here or at least uh, replicate is the process. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of constraints around the legal requirements and, and Linda could talk a lot about that and she's actually asked for all the DSAs and MOUs from all these organizations. She's done a crosswalk, she can tell you this uh, this amendment is, is similar to this one, but it's really, uh, most of the way this happens is that uh, somebody sends a request, hey, I need your data, here's our DSA, can I get your data? And that's about the end of it, right? The lawyer said, red lines it, they send it back, no, but for us it's about the process. And it's more than just about the legal constraints, it's about uh, broadening our understanding of what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And if we're sitting around the table, like we were saying, we can kind of get down to what the real kind of uh, challenge or hurdle is. And I think that that's the thing that, um, in addition to this process of developing a common MOU across all of these organizations, is building the collaboration and building the understanding so that we can put that signature on the line and actually get the job done. And I'll, I'll if you we, can, we should get yeah. going. Sir, with the microphone. Yeah, I <clears throat> have a question with respect to data integrity. Um, one of the issues that, that, that's being brought up, if you just, you know, if you remove the data um, scientists, the quants, et cetera, have you presented or considered presenting this data to, let's say, the salt of the earth people? They're not scientists, they're not mathematicians, but those who have worked, you know, in government 20, 30 years, who can actually take a look at it and to pretty much, you know, say, determine, well, does this really make sense? And possibly even to come up with questions that management or government haven't even thought of because you have a very short window, these individuals who work 20, 30 years, who have so much knowledge, you know, up here will be retiring soon. And once they're gone, mm -hmm. they're gone. And the next generation will only be relying on the data, not on, let's say, the gumshoe approach, for example, as you mentioned, to going to a particular house and you know, finding out what the real story is. So I wanted to find out to what extent are you looking into that process? So it's a discussion, and, and just for context, none of us are technologists. And so Linda, raise your hand, put it up. So Linda, um, <laughs> she's there. No. <laughs> so, no, 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 I'm, I'm, there's a point to be made here. So Linda started the, Linda, they can't see you. Literally raise your hand, thank you. Okay, um, and so Linda started the Young Men's Initiative in New York in 2011. Um, I've spent, 10 years working in and out of government and community organizing, formerly NAACP. Um, Cyrus, before he was at the Obama Foundation, led that, the work in New York that Linda helped create. Um, Noel has been in city and local government his entire career. And so the fact that, that we're not technologists has added value to this project, yeah. because when we get in front of people in cities, like we've led programs. And so what Bright Hive does is help translate that message. Um, and you're absolutely right. Um, we know the, the numbers in municipal government, once the baby boomers fully retire, there's going to be this vacuum and our city is going to start to crumble because we haven't done succession planning. Like there's no one that graduates from college and says, I want to be the deputy director of health and human services yeah. in my city town. Yeah. Um, and so in, inherent in that, in this project, is us trying to put things in place where people can pull from knowledge and contextualize. Um, I would say the, the other thing we're thinking about is, is the toolkit that Cyrus talked about, like the change management strategy. Like what does it mean to make a data-informed decision? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes the data is wrong. Mm -hmm. 
and sometimes the dad doesn't tell you the full story. Mm -hmm. And so we're going through this. Like we have work groups of really, really smart people from big institutions that are thinking about this, and we're aggregating it so that as we get further along, we can share that information and then really get feedback and scrutinize because maybe we've missed something, and we're open enough to figure that out and, and focus and refocus. And, and I just want to double down on that point. So when I got to uh, City Hall, there was this report. It was called the Disparity Report. It basically showed a backwards look at like disparities between young men of color and their counterparts in all these different systems across the city. And it was a great way of setting a baseline understanding of kind of, okay, if we say we want to improve outcomes from where and from what, right, and, and setting that baseline. It was like, you know, Voldemort in City Hall. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to have a meeting on it. <laughs> we, didn't want to, we didn't want to think about it. And it took me bringing like Maya Wiley in the room, my deputy mayor in the room, and saying, if we can't be honest about what we're doing here and what we're not doing well, then how can we ever go out and say we're doing a community meeting and meeting them honestly and authentically if we're not even copying to the things we're not doing well? If you're, you're a lawn cutter, cut only half the grass every time and then kept and, and asked for full payment every single time, you would eventually have a conversation about half that grass that's not getting cut, right? <laughs> that's the same thing we're doing with community. We're missing over and over these gaps in their lives. And then we're going to them saying, trust us. Give us more. Give us more responsibility over your lives. To, you know, vote. You need to get out and vote. Why aren't you voting? Because nothing's happening for me. So why do I continue to be asked for my vote, right? And so I think that at the end of the day, us not being data scientists is a benefit to this project because I'm a strategist. All I think about is when we get in a room is how I help align the people's interests around that table. And that's from the lawyers all the way down to the, the mayor in terms of what do they need out of this in order for them to green light this. Same thing with Neobly, same thing with Noel. And then we're smart enough to hire people that know what they're doing on all the other stuff, right? But it's hard to get the right people in, in the room. And I think we've seen enough failure in this arena to recognize what has been done wrong before. And, and I think we're, we're trying to counterbalance that now by making sure that we have the people that can talk to people in the room first and foremost to get the agreement and then move on to the technology and on to the implementation. Let, let me say this, that comfort is the enemy of change. See, comfort enters your home as a guest, remains as your host, and will eventually become your master. <laughs> <laughs> Hands down. And what I like to have conversations centered on is how I can make you uncomfortable. Because that's where we spark the, the catalyst for change. Yeah. You know, Obama president said that there's this a fierce urgency of now. And I think that in our country, in our communities, that's where we are. So the discussions about data integrity, the ethical use of data, the encryption and security are important. But what's most important is the people. Because that who's sitting in the garages in our neighborhoods, who's looking to us saying, where are the answers? And it's not the proverbial, knock on the door, I'm the government, I'm here to help. <laughs> but when you mix that, right, and, and the alchemist kind of approach, with the level of integrity and intentionality, then we can start moving the needles in the lives of people. And we can no longer deal with the silent bigotry of no expectations. We have to expect more to get more. I think we'll end on that note. Uh, we've gone a little bit over. I want to thank you all for joining us, uh, Cyrus, Noel, and Neobly. Uh, we got a lot of work cut out for us. Yeah, I think yes, we're we definitely enjoying it. and. Uh, we're here for any questions that you might have afterwards. I'm going to give you no, uh, Neobly's cell number so you can call in directly. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Look them up in the global. Yeah. Uh, and with that, we thank you. <laughs>